the Zero Hour. I'm your host, Richard R.J. Escal. As I keep saying, a lot of people uh, in politics and in the media express, quote-unquote, concern about Social Security, concern about its financial viability and about its future, but they don't really want to address not only what Social Security does for everyone, but some of the real issues underlying our economy's broad problems, uh, and they don't have to do with Social Security as a program. They have to do with the very things those people don't want to talk about. Uh, here to help us understand what I mean by that is Linda Benish. Linda is the uh, Communications Director at Social Security. Security Works, and uh, obviously a, a good friend and a colleague. She is also the author of a recent article in inequality.org entitled, headlined, Inequality is Weakening, excuse me, Inequality is Weakening Social Security. Here's how we fix that. So first of all, Linda, welcome back to the Zero Hour. Thanks so much as always for having me on. Uh, always a pleasure. So let's start with this. Um, your article was timed, as an article of mine was recently timed, to come out on uh, the, a very special day at the end of uh, February. What was that day? So that's a day, February 28th, that we call Scrap the Cap Day because Social Security um, contributions are capped at about $160,000. And what that means is 94% of workers, so everyone who makes less than $160,000 a year, are paying in all year long. But people who earn a million dollars a year stop paying in on February 28th. So they are done for the rest of 2023. They effectively have gotten a 12.4% tax break while the rest of us continue to pay in. And that's important why? So that's important because this is revenue um, that's not going into Social Security, that's just going straight into the pockets of some of the wealthiest people in this country. And I should also say, like, people who earn a million dollars a year just stop paying in, but there are folks who stop paying in even sooner, like Tucker Carlson, who earns uh, several million dollars a year from Fox, stopped paying in on January 8th. Um, Joe Rogan, who reported the earns millions of dollars a month, stopped paying in around January 2nd. And uh, you, people don't have to pay Social Security contributions at all on their unearned investment income. And so there are some wealthy billionaire CEO types like Elon Musk who brag like, oh, I don't take a salary. But all that that means is that all of their compensation comes in the form of stocks and unearned investment income, and they don't have to pay a dime into Social Security on that income. So it's very likely that Elon Musk is going to pay zero into Social Security this year. Um, you know, one year, Linda, I tried to figure out uh, how quickly uh, Jeff Bezos reached the cap, and I got 28 seconds uh, after the ball dropped. He had got, earned his 160000 He was free and clear. Some other writer uh, had the same idea and came up with 10 seconds, but I, no, I was being conservative. Uh, but less than half a minute, either way. So, uh, as you say in your piece, uh, the kinds of people I was talking about in the introduction, right-wing politicians, cable news pundits, and, you know, I would add probably some so-called sexists as well, they keep saying, uh, you know, we can't afford, quote-unquote, Social Security at the current level. Uh, why... Aren't they talking then about scrapping the cap? If they're really concerned about, and you know, I wrote about this myself, but if they're really concerned about the finances and the financial health of Social Security, uh, I would assume it would make a huge difference if we lifted that $160,000 and two hundred, dollars cap, to be precise. Uh, Ninety-four percent of Americans don't don't reach that. These other people go way way past it. If we lifted it, I would assume that would go a long way toward restoring uh, anything these people say they're concerned about with Social Security, right? 
No, absolutely. It would make a difference of trillions into the Social Security Trust Fund. And if the wealthiest people in this country paid in all year long on all of their income, including the unearned investment income, we can afford to not only protect Social Security and keep it strong for many decades to come, but also to expand benefits, which is really important given how modest the average benefit is. Um, and let's talk about that modesty, because what we're hearing is, on the one hand, we can't afford to pay these benefits as if, and you know, we all remember who, who, who write about Social Security and deal with Social Security, we all remember the phrase greedy geezers to describe uh, 310 million Americans who will, uh, are likely to collect Social Security someday. So, uh, you know, these quote unquote greedy people whose benefits we can't afford, uh, how are they doing either compared to, uh, you know, other parts of the economy or, or to retired people in other countries? Yeah, so wealthy people in this country are doing very, very well. And in fact, uh, more and more income as inequality has increased over the last uh, several decades is above that cap now. So. Um, in the 1980s, the last time that the cap was adjusted, um, the people who were doing it were trying to factor in the retirement of the baby boom. Like sometimes pundits will say, oh, all these people are retiring and no one could have predicted this and it's so bad for Social <laughs> Security. The truth is people right. did predict it. They could do math and they really did plan things out um, so that things would be ready for the baby boom to retire. But what they couldn't have anticipated is massive increase in inequality. So at the time that they set the cap, very few income uh, earned in the country was above that level. But that amount is now doubled, both because more people are making above the cap, which is now at $160,000, but also because the people that are making more than that are making far more than that. So now we have salaries that are well into the many hundreds of thousands and even in the millions. And then meanwhile, on the other end, uh, people who are in less than the cap, a lot of them are making less and less. So that's a smaller amount of income that Social Security contributions can be collected on. And it's gone from uh, in the 1980s when they adjusted the cap, um, about 10% of income was above the cap, and now it's 20%. And that's a huge difference. Yes, it, it really is. And, you know, if you look at that, that famous, it should be famous anyway, graph of how... Uh, increases in productivity and national wealth were shared up to about 1968 or so between employers and owners and investors and working people. It, it tracked very closely together and then it started to split apart and get wider and wider. I mean, it's a little dark as an analogy, but I would say it kind of looks like the Challenger launch, you know, that those two lines separating. And uh, as that lower line of working people went lower and lower, uh, they're the ones who are paying in all their income. And as that upper line got higher and higher, uh, more and more of it was outside uh, in what people projected. So even from 93, uh, excuse me, from 83 onward, you know, that continued to widen and widen. As you say, people missed it. The other big trend was that executives started getting compensated more, not in, like you said, not in salary, but bonuses, stock options, and so on, which don't get taxed at all for Social Security. So uh, it seems to me a lot of the people kind of wringing their hands over we can't afford it are the same people who aren't contributing their fair share to support it, fair or not fair. Yeah, I would agree that a lot of this is self-interest, that many of those folks who say, oh, we can't afford Social Security either, they're personally making above the cap and they want to keep their tax break. And usually it's and and not or, they're funded by people who are making way above the cap or make all of their money in unearned investment income and have um, massive amounts of money on the line if they were asked to pay their fair share into Social Security. So this is really about greed, plain and simple. It's about people who want to pick our pockets, reach into them and steal our money instead of paying their fair share. The, um, by the way, the billionaire, the right wing billionaire, Pete Peterson, who really in a lot of ways started all of this from the organizations he's passed away, but some of his organizations have survived and continue to, you know, 
push this line like the Committee for a Responsible uh, Federal Budget, so-called, because it's responsible to starve old people and the disabled to protect billionaire income, I guess. That's their idea of responsibility. Uh, but Pete Peterson, the, the billionaire who started this, uh, was uh, proud of the fact that he got a lot of Democrats as well as Republicans to go along with it put together all sorts of foundations to attack Social Security and Medicare. And I, I read that he took the billionaire's pledge, uh, which is a pledge that some billionaires take to d d devote a large percentage of their wealth to causes they support. And my reaction was, please don't. Give it to your kids or you know buy another airplane or something but the last thing the world needs is for more billionaires to uh, skew the debate the way peterson and his minions are doing and those minions are still around as as you well know right yeah at this point they're zombie organizations basically just supported by uh, pete peterson's last bequest the cause that he supports is keeping his own class's wealth at the tippy top yeah, and they were the ones who came up with the phrase, the can kicks back. Uh, your one favorite of my phrase. <laughs> my favorite phrase. You know, and, uh, you know, this, somebody's can is going to get kicked if they say that again, and it ain't going to be mine. Um, it just drives me crazy. Uh, we've kicked this can down the road. You're absolutely right. We have to tax millionaires and billionaires today. It's irresponsible of us to wait another day to do it. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Um, and by the way, Linda, you know, I think you know that Pete Peterson uh, tried to get me fired from the Huffington Post. Did you know that? I actually didn't. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, I was writing so much about him. And just because I knew he was trying to be um, present himself as nonpartisan. And uh, I always used to describe him as the right wing billionaire Pete Peterson. That's how I always started every article because I knew it bugged him. So first I got a letter from his press secretary saying, uh, Mr. Peterson wants you to know he's not right wing or conservative. He supports both Republicans and Democrats. And I wrote back saying, well, well you can be conservative or right wing and support some Democrats and still hold those positions. But please write me back with any liberal or progressive positions. Mr. Peterson has taken on the issue. I'd be happy to include those in my next uh, piece about him never heard back so i kept saying with more pleasure this time the right-wing billionaire pete peterson and then uh they wrote to ariana huffington saying that i should be fired which showed a fundamental misunderstanding of the business model of blogging but uh um no, so, you know, I, I, it's nice to know I irritated him a little bit. Uh, and Alan Dershowitz, too, but I digress. So, uh, um, so what can we do, Linda, about uh, this crisis here? Uh, because it's a crisis only in the sense that uh, they're going to use whatever short, shortfall is expected. Well, let's talk about that for a second first. So, okay, based on current projections, there'll come a point, in, and correct me if I'm wrong, in the next several years where Social Security's trust funds will be depleted and the money coming in won't pay 100% of benefits. Now, that's if absolutely nothing is done. Now, I have my own theories about what will happen then, and which is I think it will be politically too unpopular for Congress to allow that to happen. But... What do you think will happen if we do nothing? Yeah, so when people talk about kicking the can down the road, they're often talking to people my age and younger and pointing to that shortfall and saying, oh, look, see, Social Security is not going to be there for you. And so we want you to expect nothing so that you'll expect um, so that you'll take less. And so the shortfall, it's really been uh, used by people with political motivations, ideological motivations who want to cut and even dismantle Social Security to weaken confidence in it. And I'm here to say to everyone, and especially to young people, that Social Security is going to be there for you, the full benefits that we've earned and that we're promised, as long as we fight for it. Um, and so Democrats are increasingly unified around this idea that the wealthy need to pay their fair share, pay in all year and all of their income. Um, 
that's something that 90% of Democrats supported a bill in the House that would raise the cap and strengthen Social Security's finances, close that shortfall, and improve benefits, and is fully paid for by requiring the wealthy to pay their fair share. 90% of House Democrats supported that uh, last year. And then uh, there's also a bill in the Senate, and it's something that President Biden campaigned on. So I would say as long as Democrats really stand united around that, um, Republicans are going to have a very hard time fighting back against the fact that it's something that even their own voters support. We see really high levels of support from voters across the aisle uh, for this. So it's uh, just something that in the end, if Democrats stand united and don't agree to join hands with Republicans and go behind closed doors and cut benefits, then Republicans will ultimately have to cave to what their voters want, which is to make the wealthy pay their fair share and expand, not cut Social Security benefits. Well, thank you for addressing us young people on that. Um, uh, how do you do, fellow kids? But um, I'm not always sure if I count any more of these days. You know? <laughs> right, right, it's hard to tell. It's a moving target. But uh, my whole generation got old thinking they were still young, you know, because we were branded as young when we were young. But um, on that question, you know, Stephanie Kelton, the economist who's been on this show a couple of times, says, I, I, I haven't talked to her about it in a while, but she used to say that every time she asks a college, a class of college students, do you think Social Security will be there when you retire? Like most of them say no, raise their hands and say no. And to me, that's the one of the biggest cons of all around this story because and around this issue because you know the old mission impossible tv series yeah they used to rob a safe by uh convincing you that it was already empty you know they put in a camera to show it wasn't there and then they'd leave the door open and then they'd really you know that kind of thing and it seems to me like that's what they're trying to do with social security is convince especially younger people oh you're not going to have it so then they don't with the idea being that then they don't resist uh, when they start to strip it away. And uh, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I feel more encouraged now. I feel like maybe more young people are, uh, you know, understanding that this is a con job and that they, you know, this is a program they can and, and should fight for. But I don't know. What do you think? No, I think Pete Peterson spent a lot of his money just propagandizing to young people saying that you're never going to get Social Security, um, as we've been saying, trying to tell people they'll get nothing so that they'll accept less. But I do think that young people are less willing to accept that now. And part of it is that I think the con job really relied on members of both parties being cooperative. And I think even your very funny story about uh, your Huffington Post blog and the angry response is because these organizations really value their nonpartisan designation. Um, you know, in all the mainstream media, they love to be identified as the nonpartisan committee for a responsible federal budget. Right. And that's because people read it. They're like, oh, well, if this group that, you know, is non-ideological is telling us we're not going to get anything, I guess it must be true because there's no way they could possibly have an agenda. Um, but that relied on Democrats being cooperative. And it's been really heartening to see that they've become much less so over the last decade. And my favorite recent thing that happened is that there's a bill um, that Senator Mitt Romney champions called the Trust Act that would uh, have Democrats and Republicans go behind closed doors in a committee and fast track cuts to Social Security benefits. And there was a lot of talk like, oh, maybe that's going to be the ransom that they give Republicans for raising the debt ceiling. Um, and the White House was asked about that, and they responded that such a commission would be a death panel for Social Security and Medicare. So that was, was really a good big, line. Yeah. 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 And, and it was a, a great stance because it was not so long ago that Barack Obama, as president, was whatever people think of Barack Obama, was, was signaling uh, hard that he was willing to perform some sort of cut on Social Security, for example, by including a lower inflation calculation, uh, the so-called chain CPI, which is a de facto benefit cut. It is a benefit cut. By including that prospectively in one of his budgets, I forget what, I think it was a 2013 fiscal year, I can't remember, but in order to try to cut a grand bargain with Republicans, and of course, Joe Biden was the vice president then. So the party has clearly 
uh, you know, moved on this issue. We've had, uh, uh, we have the whole question now. Uh, uh, you know, the first couple times that that the White House, the Biden White House said, no way. I think a lot of people said, well, you know, they say that now, but we'll see what happens. But they keep saying it, don't they? Yeah, they do. And just using that really strong language about death panels, uh, that's something that would be really hard to walk back. And so it makes me think that they don't intend to do so, as well as that exchange that Biden had at the State of the Union and that He's really been saying, I will veto anything that comes to my desk that cuts benefits, absolutely not. And so I think the message that that sends to young people is that Democrats are really fighting to defend their benefits and that there won't be cuts compared to the message that Obama was unfortunately sending to young people, like many of whom really looked up to and admired him a decade ago, um, which, yeah. And that, you know, Linda, uh, uh, some of us, you included, me included, uh, have been begging the Democratic Party for, uh, I mean, not begging because that implies subservience, but, you know, have been desperately urging them, are you guys, why aren't you guys doing this? You know, this program is a Democratic program in creation. People love it. It's, uh, you know, it clearly, but, you know, so we're seeing this to me, among other things, is a great example of, you know, we can't just be led by elected officials. We can lead them. We can guide them. We can change their thinking. And I think we're we're seeing that now. Uh, it, it, it's a sea change to me. You know, with all the things that go wrong, it's it's something that's trending, uh, at least trending in the right direction. And I and, and I'm happy about that. Uh, but I still uh, I still you know I'm sorry that. We can drop the Democrats. I, I, I am sorry about this. Biden's pledge not to raise taxes on anyone making less than four hundred thousand dollars a year, because it really, uh, there, the last survey I saw was twenty thirteen. But people were very willing to pay a few dollars more in Social Security tax every paycheck in order to have better uh benefits when they retire. So, I mean, I think Bernie's plan uh, and Jan Schakowsky's in the House raises it so let's talk about actually you know i'm getting ahead of myself here um i'm not ashamed to admit it but uh so let's talk about uh, uh some of the proposals that, that are out there obviously the first thing is no cuts to social security stand firm right and that seems to be holding as far as i can tell if you uh, you know which a few years ago it was tough to get to that point uh the ideal thing it is, I think you'll agree, uh, not a generous program compared to similar programs in other countries. And given that other forms of retirement financial support have kind of eroded badly. And um, so the other issue is expansion. And there are a couple bills that would expand benefits. Maybe we should talk about those. Yeah, so as you said, the step one is getting the Democratic Party united around no cuts and then also trying to get some Republicans to listen to their constituents and at the very least be it no cuts. So to that effect, Social Security Works has a pledge campaign which folks can find at don'tcutsocialsecurity.org and that's where we're asking every member of Congress, Democrats and Republicans to pledge that they will not vote to cut Social Security benefits current or future under any circumstances. And if folks go to that site, they'll see that we have most but not all Democrats on the pledge and we're still working on getting Republicans. But if folks are able to check out the website and contact the members of Congress, um, especially if they're not on the pledge, but even if they are, because thank you is something that the good members are not always hearing enough, that would be really sure. helpful in our fight. Yeah. Um, That's for sure. So it's don't cut social security dot org. And, uh, you know, uh, just a side comment, Linda, it cracks me up how many politicians, elected officials uh, get offended when you ask them to sign a pledge. As, uh, you know, uh, it's like, what? You want me to keep my promises? Uh, that's uh, but of course, the Republicans learned that trick long. The conservatives learned that trick a long time ago. But uh, it's a great idea to say, look, pledge that you won't 
you won't do this. You won't go along with any deal that cuts Social Security. But Linda, you said most Democrats have signed on to it. Who hasn't signed on to it? I want names. I <laughs> Do we know who hasn't signed on to it? Firstly, a whole lot of Republicans. And, you know, I never want to lose sight of that. That, yeah, yeah of like, there's still a handful of Democrats that are bad, but it's also the, pretty much still the whole entire Republican Party, even the ones who say, oh, no, we're definitely not going to touch them. If you really parse their words and look at their records, that's not accurate. Um, but in terms of Democrats, I mean, you won't be surprised to hear Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. Well, I guess she's not technically a Democrat anymore, but as people who caucus with Democrats that we're concerned about, Angus King of Maine is another one who's very much in that category. He's an independent who caucuses with the Democrats. And it's been reported that he's working with Republicans on a quote unquote bipartisan plan that includes raising the retirement age. So if anyone's from Maine, please give Angus a call and tell him uh, well, some things that I probably shouldn't say on the radio. No, right. ask him very politely to please stop trying to cut our own benefits. And I, that's Angus King, not Angus Young from ACDC, who's like a way better player than Angus, uh, guitar player than Angus King. But OK, so, yeah, hassle Angus King if you're in um, if you're in Maine. And, uh, of course, Cinema and Mansion, uh, no surprise there. I'm sure producer Troy has some thoughts on that, being a West Virginia activist. But um, all right. So we have a couple bills out there, right? We have. Uh, we have the Social Security Expansion Act. That's Bernie Sanders in the Senate. That and with Jan Schakowsky in the House, and I believe one other senator as well. Uh, and uh, is that right? Yeah, it's uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren are the lead sponsors, and then there's several other senators. I think around five or six who are also co-sponsors. Okay, and then in the House we have Schakowsky and at least one other name I've seen on it. Uh, so this bill would reintroduce the cap at $250,000. The idea, I think, being besides politics, that you know, there are families that are trying to get by, I mean, you know, $162,000 is a lot of money, but, uh, or $161, or $160, $201, uh, you know, it's a lot of money, but it's still some people in high cost areas, you know, I mean, we don't want to, alienate them or, or or give them more stress. I think that's the logic there. And these bills, I think, have been des designed that way for a long time. So there's that. And uh, then, uh, you know, Representative John Larson, who's been on the show a few times now, oh, I, you know, I just like the guy. But he, uh, he had the Social Security 2100 Act, and now he's got the Social Security 2100, a Sacred Trust Act, right? Is that right? Is that what it's called? Yeah, that's the one that I had referenced that um, it hasn't been introduced yet in this Congress, but in the last Congress, it was supported by about 90% of congressional Democrats. So a lot of support there. And then on and the by support, but I'm sorry to interrupt, Linda, but I think by support, you mean 90% uh, of Democrats in the House, if I recall correctly, actually co-sponsored it, signed on as co-sponsors, didn't they? Yes. So that's, you know, and in that last Congress, you've almost passed it already. So I never understood, for example, why the whole force the vote movement on Medicare for all, which I strongly support, wasn't forcing a vote on Larson's Act, you know, which had so much support, it, it could conceivably have passed. And we could talk about why it wasn't put up for a vote, but that's, yeah, all right. And uh, water under the bridge. Now he's got something called the Trust Act, uh, a sacred trust, which is unfortunately too close a name for me to Romney's Orwellianly named so-called Trust Act. Trust me, you know, um, would I, would I, you know, would I do anything to you? The Trust Act, Romney. But Larson's bill, I think, has been redesigned to uh, conform to Biden's statement that he doesn't want to raise taxes on anybody making less than 400000 a year, hasn't it? Yeah, that's correct. And what I would say to that is it's, you know, not a pledge that I personally would have made or how I might write an ideal bill, but that given that rising inequality over the last several decades that we've talked about and how much wealth has flowed to millionaires and billionaires, how much has made an unearned investment income, I think that it's okay for the fact, you know, that if 
the cap is at four hundred thousand dollars if that's where we're starting to collect contributions again that means that the additional income is going to come from the very wealthy who can very well afford it and the other point that i would make is that the cap goes up every year um due to inflation and so the idea is that eventually as it raises um more people would be contributing and so for example with the sanders warren bell that it creates a donut hole between one hundred and sixty thousand dollars and two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. But with time, that would close as the cap goes up. Yeah, it's just sort of indexed to inflation or something, right? And um, so those are two bill. Well, one's about presumably going to be introduced soon. Uh, the other one is is that introduced yet? I know it's I've seen the talking points on it, but uh, is that is the uh, Sanders Warren Chukowski, uh, the Social Security Span Expansion Act? Is that out yet? Yeah, that has been introduced and it has the support of several other senators and a good number of members of Congress, uh, House members as co-sponsors as well. Um, so do we well of course the republicans control the house so kevin mccarthy is probably not going to let that come up for a vote because uh, it would hurt his uh, you know hurt his uh, his guys who are uh, you know against it but um what about the senate any chance of seeing a vote on that well we certainly would like to see a vote in the senate uh a focus of ours at Social Security Works has been talking to the White House and convincing them that while they've been getting a lot of political mileage out of opposing all cuts to benefits and vowing to veto them, which is great, that the next step should be to release an expansion plan. Um, and then that really could be the official unified plan of the Democratic Party and something that I could see Chuck Schumer bringing to the Senate floor for a vote. Well, it would give them something, it would give the Democrats something to go into the 2024 election with, which is if they could put this bill up and they could then go back to the electorate, to the voters and say, we work to get this passed to give you a decent social security benefit better than the one you've got now and to pay for it and or the republicans stopped us so we need you to elect more of us in 2024 and a re-elect uh, this administration so that we can get this done that to me leaving aside ideology and everything else seems to me that's you know just on the sort of retail politics level that's a hell of a good sales pitch isn't it Absolutely. And we've really seen how compelling even just the exchange at the State of the Union was, how much uh, conversation there's been about Social Security and the difference between the parties. And that's just by saying, no, I won't cut benefits. And so just thinking about how much more um, we could see on this if the Biden administration were to release a plan and present a clear contrast with Republicans. And that would also force them to answer the question, all right, this is Biden's plan. Well, what's yours? And if right. they say, oh, we're not going to talk about Social Security right now, then you turn it around and say, well, you're the one who have to must support a 23 percent benefit cut um, when the shortfall comes because you don't have a plan. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think on that great point, we should probably wrap it up. But Linda, before I let you go, uh, where can people go? You mentioned don't cut Social Security dot org. Did I remember that correctly? Yeah, that's our pledge campaign uh, for every member of Congress to uh, vow not to cut benefits at don'tcutsocialsecurity.org. And then our main website is at socialsecurityworks.org. And you can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and sign up for our email list. Excellent. So first of all, Linda, for you and everybody else, you know, and I guess I'm part of it too, uh, and to me too, I guess. Uh, thanks for all the great work on Social Security, and thanks, thanks to you for writing this great piece, and thanks to you for uh, for coming on the program. Of course, thank you so much for having me on. You bet. And we'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R. J. Escal, and this is the Zero Hour.